So our company is called uh, GND for short. The long name is Gieseke in Devrient. It's a Munich-based company. It's impossible to pronounce. So <laughs> we already spoke about this before. So the GND is the safe thing to say. Now, um, just very quickly, because nobody likes boring company introductions. Um, we are a security company, as already been said. So who of you here uses an iPhone? Raise of hands. Uh, who here uses or has used banknotes? Like physical cash? M more of you must have used banknotes, right? So then you have used one of our products. So we get a lot of our revenue, from, for example, from the eSIM chip in the iPhone and from printing physical cash. So that's also what we do. And no, there is no cash left over for us. So since we are already in day two of the conference, it's lunchtime, um, I have prepared some exercises for you in the session. Uh, those are not physical exercises. You don't have to jump up and down, but are some, some brain teasers. So I'm show, showing you now one line of code. It's Java code, I guess. Uh, the question is, where would this line of code be used? So if you have any idea, just shout at me. Binary search. Yes, that was fast. <laughs> that was very fast. I've had this at conference, and like people are just like, I have no idea. I've never seen that line of code. Don't know. So yes, binary search. Um, what's wrong with this line of code? Sorry? The type? No, the type is correct. Ah, come on. Oh, float to int? Yeah, I mean, in Java, the, the slash is actually an integer division, but uh, this is not where I'm getting at. Yes! There's a slight risk of integer overflow, right? So, assuming that we are binary searching in an array, then low and high would be two integers, two positions in that array, and we would expect that the midpoint between two integers is always an integer, right? But this is not what the code always represents, because if you have two integer array or two integer indices into an array, and they are large enough, then low plus high will actually give you an overflow, which will give you a negative number, and dividing that by two will give you negative numbers, so you kind of have a problem here. And this is not a new thing, like this has been known for a while, yet we keep teaching this line of code to computer science students, and we keep writing those lines of codes. Um, and this is from, an, uh, from a guy who some of you might have heard of, uh, Joshua Block, who works at an obscure software company. Um, and he wrote, extra, extra, read all about it. Nearly all binary searches and merge sorts are broken, basically because of this line, trying to compute the midpoint between a low and a high index. And that article is from 2006. Right. So um, bottom line here is this line of code looks very innocuous. We've probably all written that line of code at some point. But it turns out it can be very subtly wrong. Now. You've completed the first exercise. Let's move on to the second exercise. Uh, the next picture I'm going to show you is a picture from many years ago from a conference in Oslo. And there's something particular about the people in that picture. And I would like to know from you what is the, the peculiarity of that. So I'm, I'm giving you a hint. We are ordered somehow. Can you tell by what property we are ordered? Yes, we are ordered by beard length. And uh, by the way, um, all of these are somehow uh, involved in, in Scala uh, at the time. But it's been a long time since then, and I'm not sure if everyone still has that beard. Anyway, in order to come up with that sorting, we wrote a short piece of code in Java. So we can say sorting list.sort, and then we can compare each other's beards. So it doesn't really matter if that's the real Java syntax or not. I guess it's simple enough to understand that we're comparing beards to each other. Now, unfortunately, when we ran that for the first time, we tried to put every single person on Earth in that array to order them by beard length, and then we got an index out of bound exception. That's strange, right? Java sorting, like a built-in Java sorting routine should not be throwing an array index out of bound exception, right? If you, if you look at the stack trace, it's somewhere in comparable timsort.push run that seems like something that should not happen, right? If I'm supplying an array to a built-in sorting function, why is it throwing some exceptions, right? And the problem was because it was broken. That's the whole reason why it threw an exception. So this is a paper uh, from 2015. 
I think it actually was from the same year as the conference, <laughs> from the f from where the picture was. Um, Java Util Collections are taught is broken. The good, the bad, and the worst case. So that's kind of concerning, right? I mean, people use Java all the time, and they're sorting things all the time. And this is not a critique about Java, <laughs> this talk. Um, it's just a critique about uh, uh, that very simple things that we take for granted might actually be subtly broken. Right, so it's been fixed since then, so the, the sorting code works fine now, and it's kind of was trying to be a little too fancy about optimizing some corner cases in the sorting procedure. Now, the point here is that many, many hundreds of millions of billions of times the sorting code has been invoked, and it took until 2015 to find that problem, right? So you would think that the Java SDK is one of the most, well, the, the, the best tested piece of code in the world, yet this problem laid dormant for so long. Right, so let's talk about bugs, right? And before I want to talk about bugs, I want to talk about the typical workflow, how we develop software, right? So, I mean, this is not very agile. This is somewhat waterfall, but think just put a feedback loop in there and you have it agile. But generally speaking, we start out from some requirements, then we go into the design or the architecture. Architecture if it's in a large scale, design if it's more on a slow, uh, smaller scale. Then we implement and we test and then we operate. Now, I'm sure all of you have done all parts of this, so that's I'm not showing you something new here. But the problem is that when we talk about debugging or when we talk about bugs, we're mostly talking about those lower half of that process, right? So typically, we code something and then we notice a bug and then we fix the bug, or maybe if we don't fix notice it there, we will find it at some later point. And the farther down we go to that uh, chain, the more expensive it becomes to fix the bug, right? But it's very rarely the case that people will already find logic bugs when they are talking still about the requirements, right? So at the requirements, we have some user stories, blah, 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 so it's not really code, so we're not really talking about implementation bugs here, right? And I mean, to some extent, this is reasonable. This is reasonable because there's a probably one more paper from 2014 which literally says, simple testing can prevent most critical failures. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I, I highly uh, encourage you to read it. And basically they're saying, like, if only we would be testing more, we would be finding more problems. And that's fine, right? Testing and, and debugging and so on, this is fine. Yet, there's always some classes of problems that we cannot find by testing. Right, so this obscure Dutch guy said it once. Program testing can be a very effective way to show the presence of bugs, but it is hopelessly inadequate of showing the absence. Right, so if your tests are green, you know that some bugs are not happening, but you don't know that no bugs are happening. Right, and I want to make a quick comparison here. If you have, if you're coding, I don't know. Um, if you're coding a social media app or like some kind of, of mobile game and it crashes, that's that may be a problem for your bottom line, right? You might not be showing the ads or you might be losing the sale or something like that. But generally speaking, people don't die if your app crashes, right? That's 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 not a, that's a good problem to have to not people have to die, right? When your app crashes. Um, however, some software is a bit more safety critical. Right, so we certainly wouldn't want to be have our I don't know plane control system crash or something like that. So in some cases, testing just doesn't cut it, right? So this is the entire premise of the talk, and I'm now going to switch over from the why to the how. So how can we then be more if more safe and more secure, or however you want to call it, or more robust, and this is where formal methods come into play. Um, so formal methods is kind of a term that's, I think, not really well known inside the software engineering community. So I've brought you a definition. And this is uh, Cesar Munoz from NASA, so the American uh, Space Agency. And he defines it as follows. Formal methods refers to mathematically rigorous techniques and tools for the specification, design, and verification of software and hardware systems, right? So I hope that makes it a little bit more clear in the sense that we're using some mathematical things here. Um, but yet it leaves a lot of questions open, right? So what are, like, are these tools? Like, can I put that into my CI/CD pipeline? Um, can I, like, uh, I don't know, 
have it in my IDE or do I write code or whatever. So my conjecture here is that you have already used formal methods. You may not have known about it. I hope I have your attention now. <laughs> so there's actually quite a lot of different types of formal methods. And this is highly unscientific, this diagram. So it's basically just some diagram with an x and a y axis that I made up. I didn't have ChatGPT make it up. I made it up myself. So, um, and I'm basically trying to tell you here that there's a whole lot of different uh, design choices that you can make when, when designing formal methods. And uh, the x axis means uh, coverage. And coverage means basically the more you go to the right, the more you're working with the actual code. Right. So on the left side, I have the specification here, which means we're not talking about the actual Java code, for example. We're talking about the model of the code, what it's doing. And the right side implementation, we would be actually looking at the real artifacts that we're producing. Right. So there's this axis, and the y-axis is rigor, and rigor means the higher we are there, the more likely it is that we will catch actual problems that. Um, we can say there's like no false positives or no false negatives, something like that. So again, it's not very scientific. Now, first one I'm going to uncover is the one that have you have probably used before, which are type systems. Type systems are a type of formal method. Why? Because a type system is something that's running inside your compiler. And when the type system accepts your code, then there's a very high likelihood that certain classes of bugs are not appearing in your code. right? So not all type systems are very good at that. So in Java, for example, you can still get class cast exceptions if you're doing nasty things. But um, TypeScript also allows some, some, some things that it doesn't actually can't actually check. But there are some type systems that are actually very good at that. And even in your Java code, you don't tend to get seg faults because your type system already prevents those segmentation faults from happening. So it's not trying to coerce a pointer into something that you can call or something problems that you have in C where the type system just doesn't do that. Right? So I think you can now agree with me that you've already used formal methods because some of you, well, some of you might not like type system, but I'm, I'm sure that all of you have used type systems before. And they go towards the left in the specification column because you're only describing some very high level properties of your code. You're just describing high level property, well, this int is not a float so at some point, right? You just describe, you're not describing, well, this is actually a correct computation of the business logic that I wanted to do. Okay. Uh, next thing up that I'm uncovering is state machines. So state machines are quite a nice type of formal methods. Um, and one of the examples that we've uh, learned in uh, computer science in the, in the university was the, uh, the uh, vending machine. The vending machine is a very nice example of a state machine. You put in some coins and you input your selection, so it moves from pay mode to selection mode, where actually you start with selection and then you pay, I guess. So this is why it's good to have the state machine <laughs> written down. Um, and the other day I saw a tweet that um, GitHub has Mermaid.js support, I think, and in Mermaid.js you can actually make those state machines. So next time you write uh, a pull request and explain what your change is doing, then maybe consider putting in a Mermaid.js block and just drawing a li cute little state machine or like, okay, this is the order that's being placed and it's being processed, blah, blah, blah. And you will already find a lot of problems just writing down the state machine like, huh, I'm not sure what happens if I've already paid, but then I'm pushing the cash back button, but like the vending is already in progress, what's happening then, right? So these kind of issues you can find. Um, another thing that's somewhere in the middle is first order logic. Now I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, if you have heard it in computer science, it's good, then you can use it. Uh, if not, don't worry so much about it. But if you have heard it, you know, you know where it somehow plays. Uh, next thing is uh, flowcharts. It goes more towards the right. And uh, flowcharts are kind of a standardized way of also making state machines, but uh, flowcharts are more standardized than state machines, so this is why I put it more to the right. Um, model checking is another thing, uh, which is an interesting thing that used to be only popular in um, theoretical computer science, but it's also very practical. Model checkers are tools that can, for example, look at low-level C code and try to figure out if there's some kind of infinite loop or something like that, or if there's if you're trying to do a division by zero. So it can't know that with all certainty, but it can give you some hints. And at Microsoft, for example, all the drivers that are being shipped with Windows 10 and Windows 11 have to undergo that kind of analysis. So if you don't undergo that kind of analysis, you have to ship the drivers yourself as part of like a download package. But if you want it to be included in, in, in Windows proper, then you have to undergo that kind of model checking. And Microsoft has their own model checker for that sort of stuff. 
And going further towards the um, coverage side, towards the implementation side, we have property testing. Who here has heard of property testing? Okay, good. Uh, for all of you who have not heard about property testing, I have a talk on property testing, so <laughs> check that out. Um, it's basically a way for a test framework to generate examples and generate inputs for your unit tests. So instead of saying, I want to test this function when calling it a 0, 5, minus 1, and 23, you have the test framework generate that for you. So it's kind of like taking some of the biases out when you're trying to write a unit test. And then finally, at the top right, kind of the gold standard would be theorem provers. And I will explain what those theorem provers are in a moment. Um, but I have one more funny thing that I wanted to show you while I was doing research for this talk. So I knew that flowcharts were somehow formalized, so that there's a kind of specification of flowcharts. What I did not know was that you can actually buy this kind of stuff <laughs> to draw <laughs> flowcharts. And this is um, a DIN standard, a German standard, and also an ISO standard. So you can draw ISO 5807 compatible flowcharts with this kind of <laughs> uh, template. And uh, I, I was I was joking about this uh, uh, like on, on Monday at another conference I was, and there was a, a guy who was like I think in his late 50s, early 60s, and he said, "Yeah, I've used those. I have one of th those at home." And I go, <laughs> "I'm sorry." <laughs> yeah. So um, in case you have one as well. Um, yeah, yeah, keep keep onto them. But I mean, the template is not, I mean, it's funny, but it's not the actual specification of, of ISO 5807. If you download the standard, um, you can actually read what each of those symbols mean. So you have a syntax, which is like here a rectangle or like a triangle, and you have a semantics. So you can exactly read in the, speci in the, in the document, in the ISO document, what this is supposed to mean. So if you want to, you can really communicate unambiguously with that flowchart and, and specify what your system does. And I think this is very, very interesting, right? Because I, for one, um, I mean, there was no software architecture or something like curriculum in, in, in my uh, computer science course, but um, basically I thought it's just boxes and arrows. But turns out you can actually assign precise meaning to those boxes and arrows. Right. So now having that out of the way, uh, I want to talk about this, this, um, this verification level with, with theorem provers. And uh, what it does is you try to somehow establish a connection between your specification and your implementation. And the specification is something that we would need to write. So the implementation is something that we would typically already have or that we're right, developing. So we all know about implementing things. But what we don't really know about is how to specify things and how to then make that connection between specification and implementation. And a quick spoiler here is that the specification will have to happen in a particular mathematical language that sort of looks a bit like um, functional programming with some extras on top. And then the proofs are real proof, like mathematics, like textbook proof where you say, um, assume x and then from that follow y and then conclude with z, something like that. Now, typically, the gap between the specification and the implementation is too large, right? So we would need to have some more intermediate steps. And there's two more uh, uh, terms that I need to introduce here, which is the abstract specification and the executable specification. Um, what that means is the abstract specification is something like you say you need an algorithm that finds shortest paths between in a graph, right? So you have, for example, a map, and you need to find shortest paths. You can use the Dijkstra algorithm for that or many other algorithms. And the abstract specification say, I want to have an algorithm that finds those shortest paths. Then the executable specification would say, well, actually, the way we're going to do this is by assigning some sets and then computing some things on sets. And we're talking about mathematical sets here. And this is already getting a bit closer to the actual thing. And then the implementation would say, well, we are going to implement those sets using hash sets or using red flag trees or whatever, right? So you have these intermediate steps where you start all the way from something that you don't care about how it's being done. You just very abstractly specify what you want and then kind of refining it further and further until you arrive at an actual implementation. All right, so enough of that. Uh, I want to show you how this works in practice. Um, and since I may have lost some of you already, I have prepared another exercise for you. So I have four pictures here. Uh, the top left is uh, shells. Se uh, top, um, uh, sorry, bottom left is salt. Top right is gold, and bottom right are banknotes. So what do these things have in common? Yes, currency. So they have all been used as currency to some extent. And um, we're kind of now 
falling off the cliff here because we are not really using banknotes anymore. <laughs> I mean, non, not many people of you raised their hands when I asked this initially. So what we do in our project is we're trying to digitize banknotes. And just to be clear, this has nothing to do with Bitcoin or anything. We're talking about government currency here. We're talking about actual euro, actual pound, actual whatever. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is obviously because customers ask for us, customers being central banks. Um, but we also believe that there's a real niche to fill. Because right now, the only way that you can make payments using central bank money is using banknotes. And unfortunately, you cannot use banknotes online. And if you want to make electronic payments, the only way you can do that is using private, private sector payments, right? So you use your bank account as private money or you use PayPal as private money. And um, I think in the European Union, or in the Eurozone specifically, mo the majority of all electronic payments are being cleared by US providers. Now, the European Central Bank doesn't really like that. So they, they, they think they should have some kind of European answer to that. And one of the possible answers is Central Bank Digital Currency, or CBDC for short, which we're working on. And CBDC kind of is, you can imagine it as combining the advantages of banknotes in the sense that they are central bank government backed money with electronic, the advantages of the electronic world. So you can use it everywhere. And uh, you can also use it offline, so it you don't necessarily have to use an internet connection to, to pay using CBDC. But anyway, I don't want to bore you with, with the sales pitch, um, because our customers are basically central banks and commercial banks, right? So I'm not selling to anyone here in the audience today. I'm just trying to tell you the exciting technologies we're using. Now, one thing that's peculiar about the banking and the finance uh, thing, uh, the sector, is that people generally don't like if they lose money. Right? So that's typically frowned upon if they lose money. Yet it keeps happening. <laughs> so there's some, I have some, some, uh, some things here from the press. There's um, this is bias on US and UK. For some reason, they don't have their act together when it comes <laughs> to banking. Um, and uh, I mean, all of these things could be fixed eventually. But imagine waking up and then finding your account balance to be less than zero, e even though you have not made any payments. Right? So that's generally a bad thing. So um, this all serves to say that we have a real interest and our customers have a real interest for those things not happening. So what we did is when we were starting to develop our product, we actually started out from a fairly formal specification of what the product is supposed to do, moving money from here to there, and then actually enumerating the properties that should hold for that. So for example, when I'm doing a payment to my friend and somehow the connection has a glitch and the connection interrupts, I should always be able to retry it so that the money doesn't get lost in transit, right? Something like that. Something that's very trivial for banknotes because I can just give someone a banknote and it's done. But in terms of holding a card still on the NFC terminal, it's very hard to actually hold it still for like a few seconds. So that keeps happening. Now the way that we present money in our system is uh, by having a pair or a tuple if you want of a denomination and a cryptographic secret key and maybe some additional metadata like versioning information and currency and so on. So basically, this is a, it's a representation, it's a 20 euro, which we would represent as a number 2000, because we have two decimal digits, so we're not using floating point numbers here. Uh, 2000 plus some kind of cryptographic secret key. And the payment actually happens by physically or digitally handing over that secret key to someone else. And we can use that over, we can do that over multiple communication channels, right? But this is too concrete for formalization, right, at this point. Because we, if we want to actually describe what NFC does <laughs> in a formal system, then we would need 10 physics PhD students in order to <laughs> understand it. So we're abstracting away from that. And how are we abstracting away from that? Well, we're only looking at the operations of the, the things that we're doing to those, those, those tokens, right? And one of the things that you could be doing to token, if you're a central bank, is you could um, bring it into existence, right? So central banks have the privilege, they can create money, so here, uh, there's a particular example workflow where a central bank decides we're going to create a token that's worth 10 euro. So they can do that, right? And then they can decide to split it up into a token of 2 euro and a token of 8 euro, and they give the 2 euro token to someone and the 8 euro token to someone else. Maybe they give it to one bank and to another bank. Uh, there's also an, an opposite um, operation, so they can also merge. So they can, for example, say, I have a token of 4 here and a token of 7, and can merge them together, have a token of 11. 
Now, the key differentiator here is that the creation operation is privileged, so only the central bank is supposed to do it, whereas the splitting and the merging is not privileged because I'm not changing the monetary supply. So my wallet that's on my phone here could be doing that if it needs some change money, right? So if I, I can just trade my change money by myself, it doesn't change the, uh, uh, the, the overall money in circulation, right? So this is another property that we need. We need the property that only the central bank is allowed to change the monetary supply, whereas everyone else just can, you know, modify those tokens somehow. And I'm not sure here who remembers that or has had that in, in computer science education or mathematics education. This is a graph. And graphs are nice because they keep appearing everywhere and you can do funny stuff with graphs and you just need to open up any old graph textbooks to find interesting algorithms that you could be doing on, on graphs or interesting proofs that you could be doing on graphs. So what we did, what we did is we kind of um, uh, sectioned this graph. So we say, um, Every time we have this kind of manipulation of the tokens together with the inputs and the outputs, we call it a command. So here the C1 would be the command that creates the 10 token. And then we have another command, the C2, that splits the token again. And you see there's some bit of overlap here, so it's not entirely trivial of how, how this is being modeled. But overall, um, anyone who's into graph theory, no, any mathematician would be able to look at it and say, well, that makes sense. That's a graph, right? And then we can prove some interesting things. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is a mathematical formula with, uh, with the sigma operation. And don't be afraid, the sigma just means sum of things. So the left-hand side of this equation is the sum of something. Um, it's called UTXO. In case you are familiar with Bitcoin, that's the same thing as in Bitcoin. But it has n uh, the money that we are doing has nothing to do with cryptocurrencies. But anyway, it's just a technical term. And it means this is the sum of all money that's in circulation. So we can look at the sum of money that's in circulation and we say, well, this is equal to all this, the sum of the money that we have created minus the sum of all the money that we have been stored, right? Should be simple enough, right? The central bank can create money, the central bank can destroy money, and whatever the difference is should be the amount of money that's somehow in circulation. And this formula that they can explain in a few sentences that fits on a single slide took a few days to prove, actually. So it, it was surprisingly difficult to prove. But now we've proved it, so we can be fairly sure that uh, it doesn't happen uh, just that we, we lose the money left and right. Right, so how do we actually prove these things? Now Now I'm getting to what's more concrete things, how, to how we actually do that in our day-to-day -day, um, development cycle. And for that, there's a particular tool, which is called Isabel. Um, I don't know why it's got that name it's from the initial release came from 1985 I think it's been developed initially in, in Cambridge at the university but it's been continuously developed ever since and if you open if you download the 2022 version of Isabel and you open it it looks like an IDE kind of so it uses jaded does any has anyone ever heard of jaded I think it used to be a cool thing like 15 years ago when people were using Java desktop applications not it's not cool anymore but <laughs> but it's basically an IDE, right, with syntax highlighting, and you can hover over things, and it tells you the definition of the thing. You can control click on things, and it jumps to the definition of the thing. So it's nothing, nothing that's completely out of the ordinary. Um, what you see here as a screenshot is defining some operations on lists. So it looks kind of like a functional programming language. You can define data types, you can define functions on those data types, but you can also write proofs on these things. So uh, here, for example, we have a proof at the bottom that says if we append an empty list to an existing list, the list doesn't change. Right? So that's the kind of thing that you can do with it. Of course, that's a very trivial um, uh, lemma, but we can do more things with it. And uh, this is a quote from uh, Tobias Nipko, one of the other developers of the system, a professor in Munich. Uh, he said that this Isabel system is basically a combination of functional program plus logic. So you can just use it as a a bit weird functional programming language. You can run your programs actually when you write them in the language, and then you just sprinkle some logic on top so that you can prove properties about it. Right. So what do we do here? So uh, we uh, have formalized some parts of our product in this Isabel system. The HOL, by the way, stands for high order logic. So it's a bit higher than the first order logic that I mentioned earlier. But it doesn't matter. It's some kind of mathematical theory. And we are modeling those coins that we have that are in circulation and how they evolve, so if you can split them or merge them or something like that. 
Uh, we also put in there some graph theoretic considerations, so you can talk about reachability, you can talk about tracing a coin back to its origins so that you can make sure that no one else has somehow injected a fake coin into the system. We have some high-level correctness properties, which means that one of the things that I showed to you that the money does not get lost, something like that. And what's now really interesting is that we also have a reference implementation of some parts of our systems, um, which can be compiled to Scala code and then run on a JVM. Now, there's uh, we currently have a student working on it um, who's also adding Go support. So you can also compile it down to Go now and, in, and plug it into an existing Go code base. Um, but this reference implementation is really not for production purposes because it's really, really slow. So all the graph theoretic algorithms that we described here are really unoptimized, so we're not using any fancy algorithm. We just wanted to see the basics and get the basics right. Um, the actual implementation that's running um, is still handwritten, and occasionally we just look at the specification, we look at the actual implementation and check if, if, it's somehow, if it somehow matches. Yeah. And just to, to get an idea, I have um, copy-pasted some of the Isabel code here on the slide. So um, we can define, for example, the balance of the graph, which is the money in circulation. And the graph balance is defined to be the sum of all the values of coins that are not yet spent. Right, so we can define, we can look at the set of all the tokens that are not yet, have not yet changed hands somehow, and then all, all of that must be the, the current uh, balance. And then we can prove something about it. We can say, for example, well, that is exactly the same thing as we have if we had defined it otherwise. And the other definition would be just taking all the differences of the transactions in the system. So if a transaction makes a difference of plus five euro or a transaction minus five euro, if we sum up all of those differences, we should arrive at the exact same value. Right. Yeah. So I don't expect anyone to just read that and go back to work on Monday and do it also. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the result of many, many months of work from multiple people, even though it looks like quite compact on the slide. Right. And it's not just us uh, who are doing that. So there's many other companies, many big players that are doing that. So I've just um, put here some names on the slide. Uh, we have Intel doing it um, on their CPU designs. We have uh, Google doing it on some operating system stuff and AWS also. So they're using it to make their services more reliable. Uh, and they've also written a very interesting blog post about it. So if you Google for AWS formal proofs, then you will find that blog post. And um, yeah, they've, they've invested significant amounts of money into it because if they have, I don't know, 10 engineers working on that and they manage to make uh, AWS 1% more reliable, I think that's already a net benefit for them. Uh, even if they just make it 0.5% more reliable. So um, they, they're not claiming that they can cover their entire product with it, neither does Google, neither does Intel. So they're only working on some specific subparts of their product. Um, there's one thing I would have put here, I would have liked to put here, is Apple. So Apple using it also in their um, security enclaves of their new M1 and M2 chips. Uh, the problem is Apple is extremely secretive about it. And I know I have two friends who work at Apple in that formal methods division, and they told me uh, a few months ago they were allowed to put a half sentence in their annual shareholder report on what they're doing, saying, oh, we have developed blah, blah, by the way, which is also formally verified, full stop. <laughs> so they're not allowed to talk about what they're doing there and how they're doing it. They just like have this half sentence telling their shareholders, you know, we're doing it somehow. <laughs> so that's why you also don't find it in the news anywhere, because hardly anyone is aware that Apple is doing it. Right. So um, I want to now shift into a different gear, because basically the impression that you might have gotten by now is uh, we have our existing implementation, or other people have the existing implementation, and then they're verifying whatever they've done. Right? So they are just make the integrating as part of their, their implementation pipeline and actually trying to iron out the bugs. Now, if you remember the slide that I sh one of the slides I showed you initially about that five-phase development workflow, this is not just a technique for debugging, but we can also apply it to the ideation, the design of our product. So we can actually try to find errors um, earlier and then um, fix them early in the life cycle. And I would call that, not, not just me, other people also call that like that, some other people, uh, proof-driven development. And proof-driven development means before we're actually implementing a feature, we're doing a very bare-bounds mathematical model of it, 
and trying to figure out if it's actually correct. Now, there's a quote from uh, Tony Hoare who says, there's two ways to design your systems. The first way is to make it so easy that you have obviously no problems. And the second way is that you make it so difficult that you have no obvious problems. <laughs> Unfortunately, most systems tend towards the latter category, and so does ours. So we try to iron out those non-obvious <laughs> deficiencies before we actually move forward to the implementation. And I've brought you some examples um, from that. So one of the examples is uh, a batching. So when you have a whole batch of commands that you get from the wallets and from the banks and so on, and you want to process them at the same time, um, it's not exactly obvious how it should behave if one of those things in the batch is incorrect. So do you reject the entire batch? Do you reject everything after the faulty command? Or how do you do that? So that's one of the things that we model there. Um, another thing is uh, my personal favorite is garbage collection. So if you have a system that processes tens of thousands of transactions per second and you put them in a database, the database just keeps growing and all the nice guarantees you have about constant time lookup, they will eventually fade because your database becomes larger and larger. So sometimes you need to remove all the old junk. You need to remove the coins that have been spent because they're not useful anymore. And we actually found a few quite significant problems in our design before we implemented it by just typing in Isabel and letting the system yell at us, no, you can't do that because this is not right. So you, we said, like, okay, we think this complicated formula should be zero, and the system said, no, it's not zero. Here's a counterexample. In this case, it's actually not zero. Um, yeah, I didn't mention that the system has a counterexample generator. So if you have, if you type in a, if you start typing in a proof and it feels like the proof is not going to work out, it will just run a counterexample generator and sometimes will come up with a counterexample and tell you exactly if you put in A, B, and C, then this is not holding. Yeah, and another thing that we're working on is um, uh, these these NFC payments because NFC is quite finicky and it keeps like the, the NFC connections they keep uh, getting interrupted and you need to hold again and so on. Uh, so this is also part of our ongoing work um, to actually make sure that first of all this is fast. So we're optimizing the protocol, trying to uh, um, yeah cut some corners here and there without sacrificing correctness, but also what happens if the connection gets interrupted that we can always retry and get to a safe state. Right. So basically the question that we're asking here is, can the feature work correctly? Are there any undesirable interactions? And then only later we ask, how can we implement that feature? So kind of trying to go here in the first half of that uh, development stage. Right. So we found that this works quite well for us. And um, we have used that now for a few features. We are by far not using it for the entire system. So it would always be better to have more people working in it and uh, doing more things. But also, we have to ship at some point, right? So we have to very clearly prioritize these are the safety critical features if we need to verify them. And those are like kind of like if you have, it doesn't matter if the button appears one pixel up or not. We don't need to have a formal proof for that kind of stuff. And yeah, there's always more to do. Um, in particular, we want to close the gap between the specification and the implementation even further. So if, we, if you remember this slide, there's oftentimes some problems here in that final step because we don't have uh, a, a clear picture of, for example, Go. So we have using Go as our implementation language. Uh, and we cannot yet talk formally about Go code because Go has no semantics, it has no nothing. Um, so what I've mentioned, we have a student now working on that part to actually help us understand our Go code a bit better. Um, because yeah, Go is just the language that we're using for that stuff. Um, we're also using some parts Java. So the if you actually program those smart cards, there's a very crude version of Java running on there. And you have no nothing, you have um, no you have no pointers, you have no heap, you have nothing. It's it's a very strange dialect of Java. And yeah, that's again the actual implementation of the smart card to verify that would be huge, but um, it's also a significant effort. So somewhere on our roadmap. Yeah, and uh, with that, I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you.